Today's episode of Locked On MLB is all about goodbyes. We say goodbye to a broadcasting legend. We say goodbye to someone who was almost an all-time World Series legend. And will San Diego Padres fans be saying goodbye to a star who's already spent, believe it or not, half a decade by the gas lamp district of Petco Park? This is Locked On MLB. You are Locked On MLB. Your daily MLB podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. There I am. Hello, baseball fans. And welcome to Locked On MLB. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Where it's your team every day. The Podcast Network? No, it's a podcast network. I'm not even going to edit that out. I'm just going to plow through today. This is the daily podcast. We talk about all the Major League Baseball. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. If you don't believe me, there's my lower third. You can call me Sully. I am an Emmy-nominated television producer who has been a podcaster for well over a decade talking baseball, and I'm now really on the verge of starting my fifth season covering baseball here for the Lockdown Podcast Network, which is your team every day. Uh, it's, this is being dropped on the 21st day of February, which it means we are officially in late February. We're officially in the home stretch of the shortest month, and there will be Major League Baseball games played in the month of March. We're also going to the WBC World Baseball Classic. We're going to have spring training games coming up. All those are a nice buildup of them. We got the season. We got a lot of stuff. Hey, follow us at Locked On MLB Pods on Twitter and on Instagram. I am your pal Sully with Sully Baseball on Twitter, Sully Baseball Podcast on Instagram. I had a couple people asking me on the YouTube channel, which please feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel. I give you permission to subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'd like to get one billion followers. That'd be great. One billion followers. Come on, we're several hundred million followers short. And uh, we're really trying to get that going there. And also, please, please, let's make the hashtag Sully Halftime, make that trend so I could be the halftime show of next year's Super Bowl. And by that, I mean, I'll be doing a lockdown MLB live during the Super Bowl. I'd like to be able to do that. That should really improve our hits. Hey, um, on the YouTube channel, I had someone ask me on one of the videos that we did if I'm doing any memoriam video, and I am indeed. It's going to be done. It'll drop the morning of the first game of the season. Uh, so those of you who've been following the show since it's, this actually started in 2014 with the old show, Sully Baseball Daily, I do an in memoriam video every single year. Uh, it used to drop during the All-Star game, but starting with the pandemic season where there was no All-Star game, I had I moved it to dropping at the beginning of the season. Uh, I was asked if I'm doing it. I am hard at work at it. Um, there's uh, I have I have the music. I've picked the music and I have already begun the process of pulling some shots and pulling some clips. Uh, the interesting thing about doing it is that I try to get everyone, you know, I try to get the major names and sort of get a variety of names of people who we've lost, who have died since the beginning of last year. And, and there have been a couple of Hall of Famers and a couple of really, you know, big names in there. We lost a, one uh, the end of last week, and it's worth bringing him up. Uh, Tim McCarver died. And Tim McCarver is a, an interesting figure in baseball history, in, in terms of baseball broadcasting history. A lot of times you had seen players before Tim McCarver uh, join the broadcast booth. Some of them became uh, very skilled play-by-play people or skilled color commentators. Uh, I would argue that uh, uh, Joe Garagiola, who was a former player with the Cardinals and the Giants and a couple other teams, I would argue he became our greatest baseball broadcaster of all time. Um, and there have been several players who have become wonderful broadcasters for this and that. Uh, I loved Phil Rizzuto as a announcer. Uh, Phil was never a great analyst by any metric, and I think people 
who didn't understand what he brought to the table table kind of thought him to be kind of an oddity he was a it was like watching a ball game with your your funny uncle and a lot of times when they had players become uh hosts of the show or color commentators it was to you know they would tell stories about the games they played in and it was a recognizable personality to be paired with a play-by-play um you know jimmy pearsall uh jim palmer you know, Bill White. It's interesting that a lot of times it wasn't the superstars. And I think there's a reason for that. I think a lot of times a superstar doesn't always translate well into the broadcast booth. I think sometimes they don't have the same perspective of someone who is more of a, you know, a good solid player, but maybe the game comes too easy to them, or maybe I, I you know, I've, I've had several thoughts of it. They're, they're, not been a lot of all-time greats who turned into very good announcers. I always find it interesting when a, a they'll bring in an announcer for sort of nostalgic reasons, like, oh, person was a beloved player on this team, so we'll bring them in to have them, you know, do, do play by play and be someone that the fans say, oh, it's like my friend. Sometimes it had you know, very good consequences. You sort of see what's happening with the Mets, with Ron Darling and Keith Hernandez. Sometimes it was disastrous. When Rico Petroselli was an announcer for the Red Sox, he wasn't very good. No offense to Mr. Petroselli. But Tim McCarver was someone who spanned many decades. He was an announcer in the, his first World Series he announced was 1985. The last one he announced was 2013. 2013 was a long, long time since the end of his career. His career ended essentially in 1980 and when he was released by the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, and then he kind of immediately went into the booth and, you know, he was a recently retired player. In 19, and he was sort of did a bunch of Monday night games of the week, some playoff games for ABC. And when ABC decided to let go of Howard Cosell when they just had enough of him. They essentially replaced him in the baseball booth with Al Michaels and Jim Palmer with Tim McCarver. Now, Tim McCarver had a great set of pipes. He had a great voice. You know, that sort of kind of a down-home country drawl that he had. He had the credibility in that he was basically, he was Bob Gibson's catcher and was a big part of those St. Louis teams that went to all those World Series in the 1960s. But he also had a great understanding of the game and enjoyed describing some of the strategy and some of the details of the game in a way that was really easily digestible. Some people, he rubbed the wrong way as he was kind of a bit of a know-it-all. But do you know what? He did know a lot. And you got the sense that when he was in there, his baseball IQ was off the charts, and yet he loved explaining it. He loved explaining the details of the game. He was going to do more than just tell stories and say, oh, man, these players are tough, or this player, it was tougher in my day, or whatever. He would tell you what why fielders were positioned where they were, how batters were taking advantage of certain situations. And he would love to predict things that happened, you know, shortly before they, you know, before they did. The most famous one was he basically called the end of the 2001 World Series when the Diamondbacks were rallying against the Yankees. They had the World Series winning run on third, and they had the infield playing in, so a ground ball that could get the runner out of the plate. And McCarver said with the way that uh, Rivera pitches with his cutter, he'll get a lot of little flares to the edge of the infield. And if the infield is in, those little flares may drop in, which is exactly what happened with Luis Gonzalez's flare over Derek Jeter's head to win the World Series. It's probably one reason why Yankee fans couldn't stand him. He was the voice of, one of the voices of the Mets during the their rise in the 1980s and the fact that he was a national announcer with Mets games played nationally on a lot of cable systems probably helped his visibility, but he was a really good announcer who paved the way to a certain kind of color commentator to, who raises the bar 
of you got to come prepared. You got to come explain the strategy. Your job is to really give the audience a sense of what is happening on the field in terms of strategy and in terms of how the game unfolds. And McCarver was great at it. He had a wonderful career as a player. He was an all-star, World Series champion about the whole time, World Series hero with his one, especially one huge home run he helped in the a World Series homer. But his time as a broadcaster, he was one of the really tremendous, groundbreaking color commentators we ever had. And with that in mind, he made the job of what a color commentator, well... I guess a little harder to do. You couldn't just phone it in. So we salute you. And yes, I'm trying to pull the best Tim McCarver lines uh, and for the upcoming in memoriam video. And Yankee fans, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to use the Luis Gonzalez clip. But rest in peace, Tim McCarver. Wonderful player. By all accounts, a good man. And someone who helps pave what is considered to be the requirements of a modern color commentator. Rest in peace, Tim McCarver. We're going to go on talking a little bit about Manny Machado and a player who is retiring, who is almost an all-time legend. But first, let's talk a little bit about Built Bars. Hey, look it. It's going to get warm pretty soon here. You're going to want to not be wearing as many bulky winter clothes. And if that's the case, you probably want to look good underneath all that. You want to be healthy, right? Well, guess what? You got to try yourself some Built Bars. With Built Bars, healthy is actually tasty. They're so delicious, you won't even think they're good for you. But what makes the Built Bars so good? Well, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in great flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut, almond. I'm not sure how Built Bar does it, but these bars taste like candy bars while maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better, that they're healthy. Only 130 calories, 4 grams of sugar, and a whopping 17 grams of protein. And you don't have to wait around to get a box anymore. Remember, we used to have to mail it, you know, to get them in the mail, sort of check in the mailbox. Oh, did I get my built bars? Well, guess what? Now you can go to Walmart, go to Sam's Club, go to Walmart, go to the pharmacy section, get yourself a box of built bars, get a four bar box, cookies, cream, double chocolate, coconut puffs, my favorite raspberry. Maybe you go to Sam's Club, got a 13 bar box, brownie batter, churro, just get the best ones. They're all terrific. And you can get them all year long. So get yourself some Built Bars. And like the song says, Built Bars, they're still good. Um, Manny Machado has said that he is going to opt out of his contract. And there's been some things written about that and everything like that. And, you know, it's I, I don't really have a problem with Manny Machado announcing that. Um, it's his right it's his, you know, he negotiated for this contract that he has. And he's, this is going to be, you know, a, a year where the um, the San Diego Padres have a tremendous amount of well, expectations around this team. And he is, this will be his fifth season. And he will have played his 26, 27, 28th, and 29th year already as a member of the Padres and that was 30th year was 30th year on earth um he's had two very I mean the truncated playoff year the truncated COVID season he put up great numbers in those 60 games last year he was a legitimate MVP candidate he's been an all-star his first year was considered to be somewhat disappointing and that coming off of a disappointing World Series with the 2018 Dodgers and not putting up huge numbers this first year, I'm sure there were some people wondering, like, oh, is this going to be a bust? Oh, my God, they signed him to a 11, 12, whatever it was, year contract. Is this going to be a disaster? Well, it's already not been a disaster. And we're seeing that the San Diego Padres, who got to within three wins of the World Series last year, are looking at this year as a let's push our chips to the center of the table. Now, they know if Machado walks, they have a, a long-term solution as their franchise player in Juan Soto. And they have his backup as a, you know, his 
Robin is Batman with Xander Bogarts. And maybe Fernando Tatis Jr. gets, you know, dusts himself back off. There you go. This year, you're going to have those four players. Two legitimate MVP candidates in Soto and Machado. If you predicted one of those to be the MVP of the league, no one would look at it. What are you talking about? Bogarts, I think, is going to have a fine year, and we'll see what happens with Tatis. But this, you can't complain. If you're a baseball fan, you can't complain. You can't give him, you know, give him guff for it. You know, he's given the Padres five years. The culture of San Diego has changed the nanosecond that he arrived. And yes, the Padres are going on a massive spending spree. And by the way, giant middle finger to Rob Manfred. I know that's an evergreen statement, but going on this, he went on like publicly saying, well, I'm not sure the Padres will be able to sustain all the spending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry an owner is deciding to spend money on their product, commissioner. I'm sorry that the San Diego Padres, who for generations were the the epitome of the small market team, decided, what the heck? Let's give our fans something here. And if they go ahead, if they, you know, some people are picking them to win the World Series. I'm leaning towards them, at least as the NL West champion. It depends on what's going on with the Dodgers. But yeah, the culture's changed a little bit in San Diego. The superstars are showing up there. They're shunning big deals from other big markets to come to San Diego. By the way, I would too. San Diego is a beautiful city. I digress. But the Padres know this is a push the chips in the center of the table type year. They got the manager they wanted. They have the players they wanted. They've made some big, huge moves. They're star-studded. The Padres are still waiting for their first World Series championship. And San Diego is foaming at the mouth for a title. They've lost their basketball team and their football team to Los Angeles. They have the Padres. That's their major league team and the only one for that entire region. So, yeah, they're going for it. Now, if Machado leaves after this year, and maybe this is part of the madness of signing a Xander Bogarts, if he leaves after this year, that's his right. You know, it's funny. Fans love to have it both ways in so many ways that, you know, people would, there are people who were complaining, like, oh, he's going to opt out of the contract. But wait a minute, weren't some of these people saying this contract was too long? We didn't have a great year right out of the front? In some ways, people trash a uh, contract if it's a super huge long contract. On the other hand, if you have a contract, with this, if this turned out to be a five year deal and he gets another 10 year deal after that, good for him. Good for him. And maybe you look at the Potters and say, well, I guess we can sustain this, Rob Manfred. It's going to be an interesting year. I've never understood the, the massive hatred that Manny Machado got. And, you know, there's a couple of things that sort of, you know, he's he's done many of the things that he's been asked to do as a member of the Padres. Certainly 2020, 2021, and 2022, he's been a key player in it. He's put up some big numbers. He's got some big, big hits. And, you know, if you take a look at even some of those postseason turns, okay, in the truncated season, in the, in the in the COVID year, he didn't have a great postseason. And he didn't really have a great LCS. He had a couple of homers. But against LA, he batted 357. He slugged 643 with an OPS over 1.1 in the four-game victory over LA. And by the way, I also want to take away some of the, uh, the you know, he got a lot of guff for the fact that he had a bad World Series against the Red Sox in 2018 when he was a member of the Dodgers. But he got a, in the NLCS against Milwaukee, where he finished with an 8-11 OPS, and, you know, he wound up, you know, getting eight hits in the seven games. You know, he wasn't putting up giant numbers, but if you looked at game to game, he was always getting a big hit in that series, whether it was a hit to start a rally or to move a rally along. His Octo- He helped push the Dodgers into that World Series. Never got the credit he deserved for that. And he'll have given the Padres five years 
which was five more years than I think anyone thought they would have had. And maybe, just maybe, him showing up to San Diego was the big first step of saying, hey, it's going to be different here now. We're at least going to try, which is why I'm mad at Manfred going on about like, well, I'm not sure if this is sustainable. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's not, but do you know what you have, Rob Manfred? You have people in San Diego excited about the product. You have a potential new team who could win their first ever championship and maybe, just maybe, become one of those teams, becomes one of those regional teams that people, you know, that, that everyone, you know, loves in, in San Diego. They go to the games. It's the only game in town. And with a championship, you're going to have a whole generation of new fans. You remember them? New fans. And a lot of them been wearing Machado jerseys. Is he going to resign with the Padres? I don't know. I don't know. They've handed out giant contracts, and I know it's not a bottomless pit. And I know that there'll be teams who are looking to make gain an impact and sign a big player. Ironically, one of them might be Baltimore, where he played the first big chunk of his career. And the Orioles, by the way, whiffed so badly on the trade. But anyway, that's a different story. But yeah, he's probably going to he's gonna hop down. And I, I kind of admire him saying that right up front. Saying, yeah, I'm gonna opt out. Let's on it's gonna happen. And uh, but let's focus on winning this year. And you know what? If the Padres win this year, and he opts out and goes to the Cubs or the Cardinals or the Yankees or wherever he winds up, Padre fans will stand and salute him. Because the culture changed the nanosecond he got there. And they went from being incredible long shots and non-factors. To now being a team that, you know what? It might be a smart bet to put somebody on. And if you're going to be doing any betting, guess where you should go? You should go to FanDuel. FanDuel is our brand new partner. And we're excited to be having the number one sports book in America be part of the Locked On Podcast Network as our new partner in sports betting. Now look at FanDuel is there for your basketball, for your hockey, for your baseball. It's the midway point of the NBA season. It's the first time you can sort of say, hey, we really have a good idea of what the playoff picture is going to look like in the NBA. And now it's the best time to download FanDuel, the number one sportsbook on your phone or your tablet or whatever. New customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Download the FanDuel Sportsbook app, and it's safe and secure wherever you want to use it. And they can bet on anything, from the money line to point scores to three strains. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with same-game parlay. So don't miss your chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 of bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Um, we said goodbye to Tim McCarver. Uh, a, a less uh, serious goodbye, this is a retirement, not a death, is going to Jason Kipnis. Now, Jason Kipnis hasn't played in the major league since 2020. Um, he was He played 44 games with the the Cubs in the uh, COVID year. Um, last year, uh, he he was signed with the Braves for the 2021 season. He didn't make it. He got cut in spring training. Um, but then he take, the Braves gave him another shot, but he didn't play all year. He didn't play last year, and now he's hanging it up. Now, I'm bringing up Jason Kipnis for this reason. Jason Kipnis is uh, going to be, who knows, he may turn into an announcer or a coach. He's going to be one of these players that Cleveland fans are just going to remember as a fan favorite. He played nine seasons in Cleveland. Really, you know, he came up as a a, um, as a, a farmhand in 2011. But between 2012 and 2019, he was the everyday second baseman for the Cleveland. They were called the Indians back then. He was a two-time All-Star. Uh, he had a couple of years where he had a, hit a bunch of home runs. 
Uh, he was in 2013. He hit 17 home runs with 30 stolen bases and an OPS over 800. Solid numbers for a shortstop at any era. Uh, he made the he made the All Star team again in 2015. Uh, in 2016, he had a career high 23 home runs and was part of the World Series team. He was part of the team that won the 20 what 21 22 games in a row, whatever it was, um, and uh, got a couple big hits in the playoffs against the Red Sox in 2016 with an OPS over a thousand in the three game sweep of the Red Sox in 2016. Uh, he did his his final games in the major leagues were in the wild card series in 2020, the COVID year when the Cubs lost to Miami. And he never played a major league game again, despite the chances with the uh, with the Atlanta Braves. Uh, which I mean, you know, the fact that he was part of the 2021 Braves, I, I wonder if he got a I wonder if he got a uh, a World Series ring, even though he didn't play. I don't know. I don't know how the politics that work. But there would have been a lot easier way to know if he'd gotten a World Series ring. And Jason Kipnis is going to be a name that I'm bringing up, not just because he's a fan favorite and a you know hardworking ball player and all that, but just shows how fragile our sense of who our baseball immortals are. How a little bit here a ball that goes this way or a strike that's called that way, the fate of someone in terms of their place in baseball history can be so different. And I think of Jason Kipnis. In, he hit a couple of home runs in the 2016 World Series, which the seventh game of the 2016 World Series was one of the great, baseball games, uh, you know, it's an all-time classic World Series game. Certainly, I would say, I would say is the best game of the 2010s. Um, the game six of the World Series of 2011 is right up there when the Rangers twice were one strike away from winning the World Series and St. Louis rallied twice to tie the game and won it on the David Fries homer. But the fact that this was a game seven between the two teams with the longest World Series droughts and just a sense of something's got to give made that a special game. It was already an exciting game, but the minute Rajay Davis hit that home run off of Aroldis Chapman, it went from a very good game to a classic. There were a bunch of home runs hit that game. Davis obviously hit his. Um, I think it was... Uh, I remember David Ross hit a home run, and uh, there was it was a lot of it was just there was a lot of balls being hit. the The Cleveland pitchers were just gassed, absolutely gassed. Corey Kluber, who if the Indians had won, they were called the Indians then. If the Indians had won games five or six to clinch the World Series before Game Seven, Kluber probably would have been the World Series MVP. Uh, Andrew Miller was unbelievably effective all postseason long, was the ALCS MVP. But by the time they got to Game 7, they were just gassed. They could barely use Danny Salazar, one of their top starters, because of an injury. And Carlos Carrasco didn't appear the entire postseason because of an injury. So they were down two of their top pitchers. So they kept leaning on Kluber and Allen and Miller and some of the you know those pitchers and Tomlin. And so... The fact that it got to be tied in the bottom of the ninth with a gas to roll this Chapman playing in his third straight game and not looking very effective as he let, you know, let up the game tying home run to Rajay Davis in the eighth inning. Cleveland had a chance to win that World Series. All they had to do was score one run in the bottom of the ninth inning and they would have won the World Series. It would have turned Cleveland into title town for at least one year because the Cleveland Cavaliers won the NBA title that year. Would have taken them off the schneid of the you know the team that hasn't won since 1948 and all those frustrations of 54, 95, 97, all those years where they were losing either Game 7 of the World Series or Game 5 of the Division Series or Game 7 of the ALCS against the Red Sox or a wild card game in 2013. All these times that they were, they had a chance to move on and they didn't. It would have erased all of that. 
and Cleveland would have had their World Series title. And Jason Kipnis came up against this gas to roll this Chapman with one out in the bottom of the ninth. And he wound up hitting a deep drive to right field. Would it have been a home run? I don't know. Probably would have been a double. If it if it would if it would have, you know, the Rajay Davis home run was a line drive that just cleared the fence. I don't know if this had the height. It may have, but it did hook foul. The minute he hit that ball, everyone in Cleveland was thinking, oh man, and every Cubs fan was going, oh dear. It hooked foul. Kipnis struck out. Eventually, Francisco Lindor flew out. The game went to the 10th. There was a big rainstorm. Uh, Jason Hayward, who gave the, the Cubs a pep talk, and one of the most overrated things I've ever heard in my life, someone gave a pep talk. No kidding. I bet no, someone in Cleveland gave a pep talk as well. Uh, Zobris got the hit. They gave the Cubs the lead. They tacked on an insurance run. Cleveland scored a run in the bottom of the 10th, but eventually... Mike Montgomery came in and recorded his first ever professional save, which was game seven of the World Series. There were heroes on both sides of that. Davis, Montgomery, uh, Zobras, you know, Almonte tagging up, all those things. But that was almost the Jason Kipnis game. That was, if that had hit the wall and been a double, and he would have been on second base with a World Series winning run you got the sense the Cubs were on the verge of unraveling. You know, Lindor would have just needed a single, or maybe he would have been walked, or maybe Chapman would have been razz you know, razzled, or maybe Kipnis's drive would have cleared the wall. And he would have joined Bill Mazeroski and Joe Carter as the only people to hit home runs that won the World Series. And I mumbled off Bill Mazeroski and Joe Carter because those are two players who – names are immortal they move on we hear their names for all time because of their heroism we're going to hear david freeze's name for all time because of his heroism in that game i mentioned earlier as one of those great moments kipnis was a foul ball staying straight away from being a great world series hero one of these days i'm going to comp you know compile the foul balls that changed baseball history Willie McCovey was up with a chance to win the World Series in 1962. Now, people remember he had a line drive, screaming line drive that was caught by Bobby Richardson to end the World Series. If it was a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, the ball would have gone in the outfield. The Giants would have won the World Series. Instead, it was caught. The Yankees won the World Series. Well, earlier in that bat, at bat, he had a deep drive to right field that hooked foul. If it stayed fair, the Giants would have won the World Series on a Willie McCovey homer. The Pirates in, two, in uh, 1991 had uh, uh, the tying run on base, and Andy Van Slyke hit a deep foul ball down the right field line. Again, it had the height. If it didn't go foul, it would have cleared the wall, and the Pirates would have won the 1991 pennant. And who knows? Maybe they would have won a World Series. Maybe Barry Bonds would. Maybe skinny Barry Bonds would have won a World Series with Pittsburgh. Either way. Jason Kipnis is going to be a beloved Cleveland player, fan favorite, and the people from that era will say, oh, he was someone who was so easy to root for. But he hit a foul ball that would have been his ticket to immortality. That is how fragile our reality is. But I'll tell you one thing that isn't fragile, the fact that I'm going to be doing one of these podcasts – you know, five days a week and get ready because we're going to be doing it once this season gets started. Don't you worry. Make us your first listen every day during the regular season. And also, if your second listen, be locked on MLB Prospects. Host Lindsey Crosby, he's a prospect encyclopedia. It's going deep on the MLB stars of tomorrow. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Saying goodbye to Tim McCarver. Wishing all the luck in the world to near immortal Jason Kipnis. And saying to Manny Machado, hey, San Diego, you're different now from the arrival of Machado. This has been Locked On MLB for the 21st day of February 2023. I am your host, Paul Francis Sullivan. Please call me Sully.